Father, we reach our hands to you right now, and as we have been so greatly reminded that you are our everything. And God, we adore you this morning as we thank you for the gifts that you've given to us and as we prepare to hear your word. God, be in this place and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. God is amazing. He is amazing, and we continue to adore him each and every day, and we love him for who he is. And I am just so grateful to be able to serve this morning and share with you what God has given to me, what he worked through me this week and over the weeks that it took for me to get ready to speak to you this morning, and he is just amazing. I love that psalm too. It is an amazing psalm. So today, I sound very loud, so I have to modulate. I'm used to the lapel, and so I don't have to talk as loud as I normally would on a Sunday morning. Today, we will be talking about what to do as we live for God. And we're going to be staying in the book of 1 Peter. I will be giving you some different scripture, but we'll be staying in, the, in 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're going to take a walk through verses 7 through 11. So if you have your Bibles there, go ahead and open them to 1 Peter chapter 4. If not, of course, as always, the scripture references will be there in front of you. But I always recommend that you bring your Bible with you to Sunday service. Amen? Amen. So have you ever asked the question, what should I do? Have you ever wanted clear direction? Have you ever thought about... You know, how do I go from one place to the next? Whether it's in your your Christian walk or whether it's in your, your work life or whether you're in school and you need the teacher to explain to you, how do I do step by step by step? I know in all those different capacities I have asked, please just tell me. Give me one, two, three, four, five. How do I do this? How do I walk this way? How do I make this happen? When I was in, in sales and I was doing training and we had all these new people that were coming into our office, that was always the very first question that folks would ask is, what do I do? How do I talk to people? How do I share what we're doing? And no matter what, it was always the same thing. Just start talking. Start asking questions. It's always with the questions that things begin. So as we begin to look in 1 Peter chapter 4, I want you to take a look at verse 7. That's where we're going to start. In verse 7, it reads, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be self-controlled and clear-minded, or clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. The very first part is where I want to start this morning because you need a compelling reason why. You need a reason why to share. So in your notes, if you've got the notes in front of you, that first underline there is why. You need to know why. Why do we do this thing? Why do we walk as Christians? Why do we do the things that we do? And why do we need to have a sense of urgency as we go out and we share the gospel with people? The reason is because the end of all things is near. Jesus is coming again soon. We sang this morning about Revelation song and how Jesus, clothed in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. He is coming again. And we need to be about his business as we go. And we need to have that sense of urgency. But the question is, how do we do that? And that's the second part of that verse. Be clear-minded or clear-minded and so... Sorry. Verse 7. Be clear-minded and self-controlled. Or as the note says, clear mi- clear, self-controlled and sober-minded. See, I wrote it a little bit differently because I was trying to make sure I remembered it. One of the schemes that the devil tries to do to us is he tries to give us this false notion that we have so much time to get things done. There's so much time to get things done. We've got all the time in the world as a phrase, Right? got all the time in the world to get things. When you're young, you go, well, when I'm in my older years, after I've lived my life, then I'll serve God. I'll get all these things done, and then I'll serve God. 
And even as you get older, you still say, well, I still got a little bit more time. I can still kind of put off those things. But God is very clear that time is very short and it's of the essence. So we need to be clear-minded, sober-minded, self-controlled so that we can pray, so that we can talk to God. Because let me tell you, when I got, when Pastor Paul came to me and he started sharing, he said, Carlton, I want you to speak on this date. He gave me a ton of time to be prepared. And he said, Carlton, I want you to sit down and I want you to give me a bunch of topics and I want you to get prepared to, to speak the word to the people. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And I read my Bible and I thought about it and I even prayed about it. And I said, God, you know, what do you want me to share? But my time wasn't as focused as it needed to be. And my reading wasn't as structured as it should have been. It was very hit or miss. And does that happen in life? When you've got a lot of time between something, you kind of, all right, I'll get to it. Things start to jump up. The kids, for me, the kids jump up and they're fighting with each other. And I'm going, okay, well, I'll, you know, I'll go deal with this and then I'll come back over here. But let me tell you, God is speaking to us and he's saying, remember, the end of, uh, end of all things is near. And when you think about it that way, when you think about the fact that God is on his way back, when you think about how are you going to live your life and with that mindset of Jesus is coming soon, what can I do to further the kingdom? What does God need me to do? It changes the way you do things. Your prayer time is different. Your reading time is different. The conversations you have with people are different how you walk, even if you just go outside and walk around, the way you walk around is different. When your mind is on the things of God, when God is really pulling on you and, and asking you to move forward. So let me share with you a couple of scriptures from the word, a little bit different from first Peter, some things that Jesus himself said. If you go on the book of Matthew, so in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, it says, no one knows about that day or hour or even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Here Jesus is saying, you don't know when I'm going to come again. So be sober-minded, be self-controlled, so that you can pray and know what you should be doing. Where should your hand be on the plow? Where should you be taking the next step? Because you know not the hour or the day. And at the end of that very chapter in Matthew 24, in verses 43 and 44, it gives you that kind of, that be prepared message. It says, but understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. And then if you go to verse 44, it says, so you also must be ready because the son of man will come in an hour when you do not expect him to come. So when you pray, and when you talk to people, and when you embrace family, and when you talk to your coworkers, you don't know when Jesus is going, to re is going to return. So you need to embrace that in your mind. You need to get that clear so that you can really work on them, and you can talk to them, and you can share with them, and you can love on them. Because that's where we get to in the next part of our, our, our little flagship there in 1 Peter. It talks about loving one another. So your second underline there is love one another. And verse 8 reads, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Love covers over a multitude of sins. Love each other deeply. So as a family here, we've got to love each other. We've got to embrace each other, even when we don't want to. Because like a family, there's always going to be conflict. We're not always going to agree. We may not always like each other. But you know what? We all love each other. Amen. We reach out and we talk to one another. Don't we? Isn't that what we should do? We should love one another because God loves us. When you're praying and you're focused on who God is and you're focused on the fact that the end of time is coming and that God, what do you want me to do? His arms will envelope you and you will begin to feel that love. And when that love surrounds you and it fills you, you can't help but pour it out. You're a cup that can't hold everything. 
So when the love of God begins to pour into you over and over and over again as you pray with expectancy of God's return, it begins to flow out of you. You begin to forgive others of the past hurts in your life. You begin to let things go. Amen? Amen. Here's the thing. In your life, in the capacity of the things that you do every day, in the various roles that you have, when the love of God is in you and it begins to pour out of you, see, I always start with the men. Husbands, you husbands that are in here, it's very easy to love your wife as Christ loved the church when you recognize that God is pouring out all over you. And he's loved you and he's forgiven you of the mistakes that you make. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter 5, 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, I know I'm ahead of my notes here, but I want to impress upon you husbands, okay? You've got to love your wives as, as, as Christ loves the church because God gave first before he could ever, before he expected anything of anyone else, before he wanted us to love him, before we even had a call on our own lives to reach out to Christ, he first loved us. So you guys, you need to love your wives as Christ loves the church. You need to pour out over her, wash her with the word. You've got to be able, able-bodied, and you've got to forgive her of the things that may have happened because God is doing amazing things in your life. He's doing amazing things in the lives of us men. He's doing amazing things in the lives of the women. He's doing amazing things in the lives of the children. And he's calling us to show hospitality to each other. As we roll into verse 9 in 1 Peter, verse 9 says, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Without grumbling. Let me say that one more time. Without grumbling. Show hospitality to to one another without grumbling. When we talk about hospitality, we talk about service. And this is where I talk about you, you husbands and how you need to share and you need to love your wives because that's what you have to do. You have to love your wives. That's the, the, the thing that put on it. I know I keep saying it over and over again. It's not because I forgot where I am in my sermon. It's because it's very important. I talk to guys all the time, and I talk to women as well, but I talk to a lot of guys, and I have to remind the men, you have to love your wives. It doesn't matter what she's done or doing or not doing. You need to love your wives. Because God loved us when we were not doing, when we were not seeking, when we could have cared less about who he was. But he loved us first and he gave us that example. So love your wives as Christ loved the church. And hear an amen from the men. Let's try that one more time. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her sacrifice for your spouse fight for your spouse not with your spouse for your spouse because it makes it very easy for the second part of this to kick in now i didn't put that scripture in there because i'm always focused on the guys but if you go in uh, Ephesians 5, all the way down to 33. It reiterates, love your wives, and wives, respect your husbands. It's very easy for a wife to respect a husband who loves her and sacrifices for her and takes care of her. It may not look the way you want it to look, but she will respect you, and she will submit to you when you do the things that God has called you to do. I'm only sharing that because God shared it with me. And you guys know that when I point out here, you know the old saying, when you point your finger, you have three more pointed back at you. That's why I'm always scared to preach because I know whatever I'm going to preach about, God's going to deal with me about. So husbands, I can tell you love your wives because God has told me to love my wife. And he has told me not to worry about what she may or may not be doing because that's not mine to deal with. That's his to deal with. I'm called to love. She's called to respect me and submit. If I love and I'm doing what I'm called to do, then God will deal with her if she's not doing what she's called to do. But praise God, I don't have to worry about that. God has to deal with me. He has to deal with me. He has to deal with me. 
Similarly, for you children, and for those of us who are older who still have our parents in front of us, remember, honor your father and your mother. Go to Ephesians 6, 2. It says, honor your father and your mother. Honor your father and your mother. I share that with this room, even though there aren't a lot of younger people here, because some of us still have our parents in our lives, and we haven't forgiven them of some of the things that have taken place in their lives some of the things that they did to us. But when God's love becomes part of us and it begins to change us, and it begins to pour out of us, we can forgive them and we can honor them. We can honor them. We can call our parents. We can pray for our parents. We can pray with our parents. Because we honor them. Because we recognize that God has loved us. So children, honor your parents. Figure out how you can do that. For us that still have our parents in our lives, we need to figure out how we can honor them. How can we work with them? How can we deal with them? How can we love on them? How can we honor them? Because it is the one commandment with the promise. So go back to Ephesians 6 and take a look at that because there's a promise there. Even better yet, go back to the Old Testament. Take a look at the commandments. The first commandment that deals with how we interact with one another. It's about honoring your parents. And it's the one that has the promise. So take a look at that in your weekly prayer time and study time. And then, and then at the end of that chapter in Ephesians 6, 7, it says to serve wholeheartedly. Now in Ephesians, it's talking about slaves and masters, but I want to let you guys know this for me is any act of service. So anywhere that I serve, whether it's at work, whether it's here at the church, whether it's in my capacity of just dealing with people out in the, in, in the world, you got to serve wholeheartedly as if you are serving the Lord, not men. So that changes the way you think about work, doesn't it? It should. It definitely hit me like a ton of bricks as I thought about the amount of time that I spend, you know, not doing work. Okay? I know a lot of folks here, I'm, I'm talking about Carlton, okay? I know you guys, when you go to work, man, that eight hours you're at work, you are in it. And that's all you do, heads down, doing whatever, answering phones, writing stuff down. You are going, 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 and you're totally dedicated to what your boss told you to do. But I'm going to just share, I'm going to be transparent with you this morning. I can't say that. When I'm at work, I get my meeting in the morning, man. I hit that meeting, I get my little notes, I send my email, and then I got a two-hour window before the next meeting. And that, you know, when it should be prep time, trying to figure other things out, might be a little bit. But it's also a little bit of internet time. Send a couple emails, maybe make a phone call, maybe answer an email on my phone that someone has sent to me. But I need to focus on serving wholeheartedly as if I'm serving the Lord and not men. And when I walk, I want people to recognize that I'm doing things differently and that I am different because we are different, yes? Yes. If you call Jesus Lord, you are different. You might live in this world, but you're not of this world. You are a new creation, and God is doing something different through you. So you need to move and be different. So as we move into verse 10, verse 10 talks about serving one another with your gifts. So serving one another with your gifts. Serving one another with your gifts. And verse 10 says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, giving God's grace in its various forms. And I want to read a little bit of verse 11. And it says, If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. Because God is giving you strength, and God is giving you abilities, and he's given you a place where you can hear from him. This Bible is not some book that you put on the shelf and it becomes... Uh, you know, gets dusty. It's not something that you lose. It's not something that you put aside and, and don't think about. That's why I love the fact that I can get my Bible on my phone. 
because I always have my phone. I may not always have this with me, even though there was a time when this went with me everywhere I went. That's why it's got to be carried in this little purple thing here now because it's starting to fall apart. The binding is actually coming apart on this. And you can't read a lot of it because of all the underlines and stuff. And I'm, I'm kind of challenged as far as drawing straight lines. And so a lot of times it goes right through. Almost looks like a strike through, like Thomas Jefferson Bible, where he just like pulled his pieces out that he didn't want. So I have to be very careful about that. That's a joke for Pastor Paul, because he told me that. All right, so back to sharing your gifts. God is very clear. He wants us to use our gifts for his glory. He wants us to use them to serve others. My ability to do and, and, and work with technology, he wants to use in service of others. My ability to share and to pray and to preach and to share the word and to sit down with others and evangelize, he has called me to do that in service of others. For each one of you, he has called each and every one of you to make disciples. This is not specific to the clergy. This is not specific to the people who get up and preach on a Sunday morning. This is for all of us. He said, use your gifts. So you might not be able to get up here on a Sunday morning and, and, and share the word. Like I didn't think I would be, ever be able to get up here on a Sunday morning and share the word. It gives me butterflies every time I go to get up here. But God called me to this and I will be obedient to him. But that means in your capacity as you deal with others, as you serve people, you serve with your gifts to make disciples. You might not be sitting down with someone and going word line by line through the Bible, but through your life, through your actions, you should be drawing men to Christ. So use that talent that you have. Use that ability that you have to draw men to Christ. That's not to say that you shouldn't share the word. Because I know that there are folks and people that I talk to that have said to me, and even me at one point in my life, I felt as though if I just lived a clean life, people would be led to God by that, and I would never have to go and open this Bible and give them any word at all. Well, Carlton, what's so different about you? Well, I just live a moral life, and my life is clean, or I do this in the morning, I pray. But as I started to really do it and start talking to people about my life with Christ, people started asking me questions. And when people start asking you questions, you've got to be able to answer them. So that means that as you pray and as you read, you've got to be in this. Because you've got to be able to answer. You may not be able to answer everything, and that's okay. Because no one can. But you need to be able to say to them, hey, look, I don't have the answer to that. Let me go get the answer for you. Because people respect that. They actually don't like it when you try and make stuff up especially because in this society right now with our Google it mentality, if you give somebody an answer that's halfway weak, there is absolutely 10, 15 people online who have already said, if anybody tells you that, you know, this is the truth, here's how you refute that. So you better be prepared. Study. Serve with your gifts. And the last part of it is why. Why do we serve with our gifts? Why do we give our gifts in service to others? Why do we glorify, why do we love God? Why do we let God love us? Why do we forgive others? Why do we show hospitality without grumbling so that God can get the glory? So that God can get the glory. The second part of verse 11 says, let me read all of 11. It says, anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. So that in all things God may be praised. You got to remember that. Because see, in today's society, when anybody shows any amount of talent, people begin to push you up. They begin to tell you how great you are. I know it seems strange to say it that way, but I've noticed that in my own life. When you begin to do something different, when you begin to move in a direction that 
may seem difficult to others or is just different from the norm of what you grew up in, people begin to put you on a pedestal. They begin to tell you how great you are. They begin to talk to you about the abilities that you have and how, oh, I could never do that. I could never get up and preach. I could never tell anybody about Christ. I could never just be walking down the street and and share the gospel with someone. It's so great that you can do that. Man, you're awesome. You have to always push that back to God. Because if not, you begin to think that you are great. I begin to think that I'm great. I had, I had still challenged with an oversized ego. I'll be transparent with you this morning. And here's the thing that God does. God helped me with that. You want to know how God helped me with that? He gave me a mother. My mother is amazing because my mother has the ability to remind me that I'm not as good as I think I am. And I share that with you guys because that is a reminder to me to not ever think that I am so good. Because when, you know, I graduated from college. Wow, you graduated from college. Yeah, but you don't have a master's degree. I'm going cross country to get a job that I always wanted. I always wanted to program video games. It's the greatest thing ever, and this is what I'm doing. Yeah, but it might not last. just going to be open and honest with you guys this morning. Man, I got a job and, and I'm doing this and I'm, I've got this skill and, you know, they're, they're giving me a title. So, because here's the thing. God gave me that. It wasn't through any skill of mine, okay? God gave me favor in every situation. If you want to sit down and get a really long conversation with me, ask me how God moved me from place to place. Because I can pinpoint now, hindsight, when God moved and what he did and how he tried to reach me as I ran from him. As I ran. I mean, when I'm talking about, see, some of you guys think, look at me and you go, he can't run. Let me tell you something. (laughs) It is what it is, right? So I ran from God. God called me at a very young age. And people came to me and said, you will preach. I'm talking, I'm six years old. I remember being told, you will preach the gospel. And I thought, man, I thought that was great. I wanted to do it all the way until it started to look funny to my friends. And then I ran from God. I mean, ran. I, I left, the, I went across country to get away from him. Because everybody here knew it. But if I go to California, nobody will know. And I ran from God. And God came to me in very interesting ways to remind me that while you may have run, you cannot get away from me. And I laugh about it now because it didn't make any sense at the time. But God gets the glory for moving. Me and you. He gets the glory for the people that you talk to, that you share the gospel with. He gets the glory for your ability to run technology on a sermon where the guy who's preaching goes from slide one to slide 20. He gives you, God gets the glory when you can pray and have people be moved. He gets the glory when folks are healed. He gets the glory when your finances start to look right. He gets the glory when your finances look wrong. He gets the glory in all things because he's the one who does it. You may get a paycheck at work that has your company's name across and the CEO's signature across the bottom, but let me tell you, if God takes the money away, you can sign as much as you want. Nothing happens. And when you go in for that interview and you got that resume that looks like this and it's so great and it's got all these skills on it, If God doesn't open the door, I don't care what that looks like. You are not going to get that job. You are not going to move. It is not going to happen. But God does it. So in all things, give God the glory. So the last part of this, honestly, and I have a pastor friend who uses this phrase, and so I'm going to steal it from him again. It's time to wash the dishes. Okay? Talk about washing the dishes. That means it's time for you to get your hands dirty. It's time for you to start cleaning some things up. 
and it's time for you to start putting some things into practice. So a couple of things, and it's in your notes, so make sure you don't lose it. Take it home and actually do those things. The first one is, I want you to set aside 10 minutes a day to pray and read your Bible. Okay? I want you to do that. Now, I know a lot of you don't have that issue. You got your prayer time mapped out on your calendar, and you got a big block in the morning and a big block in the evening. Hey, keep it up. Fantastic. If you're just starting out and you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I fit this in? Just block off a little bit of time because God will honor that little bit of time. You block it out wherever you are best, okay? Let me tell you a a, a thing that blew me up was saying, okay, God, I'm going to put my prayer time at the end of the day right before I go to bed. I pull my Bible out. I sit there in my nice comfy chair and go, all right, God, I'm going to get into this Bible and sit back. All right, 1 Peter chapter... And I wake up the next morning and go, wow, what happened? So whenever you're best, if you're best first thing in the morning when you get up, do it. If you got to work out first to get your blood pumping and get your brain going, work out first. If you got to get that cup of coffee, get the cup of coffee. No matter what it takes, get your brain going and then spend that 10 minutes of time with God praying and praising him and reading his word and do it every day. Next, I want you to show love to someone in action. The only way people know you love them is because you tell them you love them. You are missing something because God's love is not stationary. It's a love in action. So for you husbands, love your wives. For you wives, love your husbands. For you children, love your parents. You don't have any of that? Love on somebody you don't know. Go find them and find a way that you can love on them and serve them. If that means, like me, I'm a Dunkin' Donuts guy, you go to Dunkin' Donuts in the morning, grab an extra donut, take it to some, and don't eat it. <laughs> Give it to somebody. Serve someone. Serve someone. Serve someone. Love on them. Hey, even better, share the gospel with them while you're sitting there eating your donut. Tell them about the sermon you heard, the crazy guy who talked about buying donuts in the Sunday service as like how you apply the Bible, okay? There's always a way for you to kind of start the conversation. Share, love on them. And of course, the question at the end of every sermon that I've ever listened to, that I've ever had to be a part of, I always ask, I've always thought in my head, now this is me listening, right? I go, okay, yeah, but you know what? When will I actually get started on that? And I want, for that, I want to share just a little short story about, and some of the folks that come to the Bible, uh, Wednesday night Bible study have heard this story before. But I work in downtown Baltimore, right across the street from Mercy Hospital. And so some of you probably can get a frame of reference of where that is. If not, it doesn't matter. So I park in the parking garage, and I've been working there now three years. So when I started there, right in front of the parking uh, garage, there was this big giant hill that went up. So that's what I walked up in the morning to get to work. Well, shortly after I started working there, they started digging that hill, digging into it, started just excavating. And what they ended up doing is they started building. So every day I would come in, and there was a big hole at one point, and then there were some beams and there was always guys with hard hats, and there was some stuff going on, and it snowed, and so things slowed down. Things picked up in the springtime. We had a guy that was here at church that actually worked on the team that was building the building. So I used to yell at him as I was going by in the morning. But every day, they were building, 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 building. And I think about the fact that every day I went into work, and I talked with folks who would tell me, you know, I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. Next year, I'm going to do this. Next week, I'm going to do that. Next week, I'm going to do that. But every day, those guys were out there with their hard hats, and they were pounding, 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 pounding. So a funny thing happened a few weeks ago. They put this big electronic marquee up outside. Electronic marquee says, opening December 19th, 2010. So in the same three years that my friends and I have talked about all of the grandiose things we're going to do, in some cases for God, in some cases not for God, these guys have built an entire hospital by doing a little bit day by day, day by day, day by day. So the question that came back to me as I prepared this message is, when, God, should I get started on what you're telling me to do? God's saying get started now because the time's going anyway. 
So you can either do nothing and see a hospital built, or somebody can build something tremendous and you can do the same thing in the same amount of time if you just pound away at it every day, a little bit at a time. So get started today. So those things that we put in there, that I put in the notes today about washing the dishes, get started today. If you can get started before you leave the sanctuary, get started now. Because if you pound it out every day, work your time in with God, if you pray, if you pray, if you let him love on you, if you let him impress upon you how he's forgiven you, if you let him change you, every day, bit by bit, you will get better. Every day, bit by bit, it will become simpler. I won't say it'll ever get easy, but it will get simpler. Every day, you'll be able to do something different in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for who you are, a God who does things in amazing and mysterious ways. So God, as you have moved this morning, I ask that you would move upon the people here. Change hearts, change minds. Show us how we can carve out that time for you. Show us how we can love on those who are around us. Show us how we can be your light. But most of all, God, show us how we can do things for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.